We're all here tonight to hear about the geology of Minnesota's North Shore of Lake Superior. Uh, most people in the rovers have spent a lot of time on the North Shore and really love it. It's, it's basically the geology is primarily volcanic rocks that erupted over a relatively geologically short period of time, approximately 1.1 billion years ago. We're gonna hear all about the mid-continent rift and, and how Lake Superior formed and where some of the best exposures of these rocks are along the North Shore. Uh, Jeff Dole is a geology laboratory supervisor at McAllister, and he arrived at Mac in 1996 after doing five years of environmental consulting. And he's also worked for the US Geological Survey. So Jeff's gonna tell us all about the geology of the North Shore. Welcome, Jeff. Thank you. Fran asked me to, to talk about the geology of, of some place that you guys frequent. And I, I came upon the North Shore as a, a place that you guys would probably frequent. And I think that's what I hear is, is the case. I have favorite spots up there. You guys will all have favorite spots. Um, sorry if I don't cover them. I, in the amount of time we have, it's it's. I'm going to do my best to, what I thought would be interesting is, is give you a background um, of, of the geology and you know the, the, the geologic history of the region. But what are you gonna encounter when you go walk along the shore? You know, one of my favorite things to do is, is go up there and, and basically look at rocks and throw them in the lake. And I think a lot of people do that. And I can identify most of them um, if you're not a geologist, I suspect that's, that's a little problematic. And I'm gonna go over at least maybe how to identify some of these things and then and talk about some specific geology and, and specific spots. So here, here's what I'm gonna cover. Um, like I said, the geologic history in the background, I'll, I'll talk about what a rift is. Um, what, are the, what are the predominant rock types that you're, you're, you're gonna see? What are the basic rock groups and, and types that, that we might encounter? Most people know that there, there's three main um, groups of rocks you know, igneous, metamorphic, and sedimentary. And then what are the types of landforms and geologic structures and, and even some of the minerals uh, that, you, that you might encounter walking along the shore? And then if there's time, there's, you know, a couple of my favorite spots, why I like to go there and, and what's, what's geologically interesting about them. So this isn't a classroom. I, I, I miss the interactive part, being able to ask you guys questions, the immediacy of you guys asking me questions. but if you can hold off till the end, I'm, I'll spend as much time as we need to, to answer the questions that, that you might have. And I'll, I'll try to keep it, you know, at, at a introductory level, um, try not to use too much terminology. And here we go. So Minnesota has an incredibly varied and rich uh, geologic past. It extends to almost you know, three quarters of the age of the earth. We have some of the oldest rocks on the planet in the Minnesota River Valley. So Minnesota River Valley has, has maybe you've been to Morton or Granite Falls. Uh, there's rocks there that are about 3.6 billion years old. And we know the earth is about 4.55. So that's, that's a pretty significant um, <clears throat> portion of earth's history that, that is encompassed by the geology of Minnesota. So we're going to spend our time talking about the, the, the mid-continent rift and the North Shore specifically. And those rocks, there are about 1.1 billion. The red stripe there, most of you, you know, probably know about the, the, um, the Iron Range and the different mines that, that occur along that specific deposit. And <clears throat> those rocks, again, are about, you know, 1.85. They're, they're older than, than the ones that we're going to talk about. The Paleozoic Basin, the rocks around the Twin Cities and to the southeast. Um, those are rocks that are, you know, 500 million years and younger, extending up to about, I forget the youngest ones that are still what we consider Paleozoic, but uh, I think they're, is it Devonian? I think it's Devonian is might be some of the youngest rocks that are there, but that's where we go to, we, we find fossils. You know, if you've been along the Mississippi River, you see those bluffs. Those are sedimentary rocks of, of that age. We, we can find one of our favorite trips that we take is down to Cannon Falls and we find uh, Ordovician age fossils in, in a ditch. And uh, that's the portion of the state where if, if you're gonna go look for fossils, that's, that's one excellent place to do that. 
Um, the older rocks to the northwest are Archean in age in general, which means they're about two and a half billion years or older. And the complicating factor for all of this then is the fact that it's all covered with glacial tilt. So we have this, this rich geologic history that extends at least into the Cretaceous, you know, about 100 million years ago, roughly, and not a lot of rocks that exist between that and then when the glaciers happened, which is in the Pleistocene. So the last 2 million years, roughly, we had four different major glacial advances that, that ice moved across Minnesota, deposited, you know, anything and everything uh, in its wake. And it covered up all the good stuff, basically, unless you're a glacial geologist. But <clears throat> we have to keep that in mind. So we can't just go out to these places and, and see these rocks. We might have to do some digging. We might have to look at drill core. We might have to use you know, seismic information or other things to actually get at what's actually going on at depth. That's not the case in the North Shore. So where the rocks are best exposed in Minnesota are, is the North Shore, which in part has to do with that glacial history. And then what we call the driftless area down in the Southeast where the glaciers were, were not as prevalent. They, some say they didn't exist there, but the, the older advances probably did, at least to some degree. So we have to keep in mind, the glacial deposits covered most of it. Um, we can go to specific parts of the state to actually see exposures, and we're gonna concentrate on the North Shore since that seems to be a favorite for, for a lot of people. So. Mid-continent rift is this large structure that consists of predominantly volcanic and igneous, well, igneous rocks in general, vulcan volcanic and intrusive, and then the sediments that are derived from those. And it extends from Kansas all the way over to, to Southeast Michigan. And this occurred about 1.1 billion years ago was, was when this, this activity started. And it continued for approximately 23 million years geologically, uh, relatively short period of time. Um, it's kind of funny. We just, we throw around millions of years uh, like nothing. And, but that's, that's when you think about geologic history, it's, it's, you kind of get to that point, but it's, it's a significant uh, event in the history of, of, of North America. So we're going to concentrate on the, on the volcanic and, and intrusive rocks that, that we'll see. There are some sedimentary rocks. I'll show you some pictures of. Um, but a little background to that is, so, so what is a rift? Why did this occur? Why? Not so easy to, to ask, but a lot of the questions in geology boil down specifically to, to plate tectonics. Specific rocks we can, play, we, we can place into specific tectonic environments. Um, we know that the earth is, is active and one of our introductory courses we call dynamic earth and global change. And, and a big part of the the grounding of, of this all boils back to plate tectonics. And a rift is simply an, an area where, where we're adding crust uh, to the earth. It might be in a mid-ocean ridge, or it might be in a continental setting. And what we see here is, is the boundaries between the major um, tectonic plates that, that exist. We might have subduction happening where we actually consume one um, plate under another, and again, I'll go back to the mid-ocean ridge or mid-Atlantic ridge, we're, we're generating new crust there. And in fact, the, the, that ocean basin is actually expanding. So if we look at a cross section of that, <clears throat> and this is just a, a, a cartoon of, of a, a typical um, cross section of an ocean basin where we have a, a, a divergent, what we call divergent plate boundary or mid-ocean ridge, we're generating magmas at, at those, those locations. Those, those plates are actually spreading apart from each other. And at the margins, uh, you might have subduction happening under oceanic crust, or you might have subduction happening under continental crust. And then you get volcanism associated with that as well. So these are all different tectonic settings, um, <clears throat> but it's, it's analogous to what was happening, you know, at 1.1 billion years in, in the past here. Uh, an analogy, for a current continental rift setting is the East African rift. And if this continues over time, and it, there's no reason it's gonna stop, um, the ocean may actually incur into that rift valley over time. Another good example of that is, is Iceland. And 
I've, I've been there a couple times. Spectacular place. If you haven't, I highly, highly recommend it. Here we have the Mid-Atlantic Ridge that actually goes onto the, the surface of, of Iceland and is Iceland is, is, is part and parcel of that, that spreading center. And we have spreading, again, this divergent plate boundary where we're spreading between the North American plate and the Eurasian plate and, and adding, you know, 10 centimeters roughly of, of material uh, every year. So that, that's kind of a, a quick background as to what's happening in Minnesota and specifically the North Shore. A lot of it is, is covered. You know, most of, of the rift as we know it is actually covered by younger rocks. The, the Paleozoic rocks I mentioned in Southeast Minnesota cover it. There's a lot of different sediments. Um, Michigan Basin sediments actually cover that. Um, <clears throat> so it, it consists predominantly of, of, of igneous rocks though. And that's what we'll see in, in along the North shore. Here's an example, just this, this was a picture north of, of Duluth. That's, a, that's a, an igneous dike. So that's a, that's a basaltic intrusion cutting through pre-existing volcanic rocks. And that's, that's happens frequently in, in what we call spreading centers or, or divergent plate boundaries where we're adding, adding crust material to the crust. So I, I'd love to stop and answer some questions, but we just, <laughs> we'll, we'll wait till the end. Um, hopefully I'm not moving along too fast, but so. If you'd like to ahead. take questions now, Jeff, you're welcome to do that. That's fine. And maybe that's a good time. If people want to, if, if there's any specific questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer them now. Magma versus lava, please. I was going to get there. Uh, good question. So magma is simply molten uh, material melts that are generated within the earth. Typically from the mantles is where they start. Uh, and magma can work its way up through the earth's crust. And if it stops and cools within the earth's crust, it, within the earth's crust, that, that will form a specific texture. I'll go over this in, a, in just a little bit. Um, if magma makes it to the earth's surface, then we call it lava. Same material, some of it makes it to the surface, some of it doesn't. Thank you. Good question. And that's that's actually what we'll talk about a, a bit here is, is, you know, what are the products and how do those products different and how do we recognize those um, when we're walking around? I've got just one question. This is Liz here. The drift list, what does that mean? Like no glaciers went over it? Yeah, so driftless simply, you know, drift is a is a generic term for for the products or the deposits of of what oh. melting ice leaves behind. Got it. Because I know there's some in what Wisconsin too. Correct. Yeah. Okay. In fact, there's there's more there technically than than Minnesota. Yeah. And and yeah, there's there's places there where we we don't have evidence of of drift. You know, glacial till. Excuse me, other deposits. Um, but there's there's argument that that some it, at least you know some of the early early ice sheets probably covered at least portions of that region and we just don't have evidence for that now but there's where rocks are well exposed as well in minnesota you know there's there if you've been along the mississippi river you can see the geology quite well if you've been along the north shore you can see the geology quite well if you go out to western southwestern minnesota there's places where, where the glacial till, the drift is over 300 feet thick. And so it's, it's difficult to, to really understand what's, what's actually happening in the subsurface and what the bedrock is in those cases. And then you need other methods to, to figure that out. So, so Jeff, I have a question. This is sure. Fran. Um, I saw the, the picture that you had of the basaltic intrusion. And yes. And it made me think of when I was um, when I was actually in in Canada paddling in the Rossport Islands. We, we saw some columnar basalt, and we Absolutely. I saw some of that on the Salmon River in Idaho. Is that the same kind of deal? It is, and the the, the columns are are cooling features. They're contraction features that it's it's material that's homogenous and that cools slowly will will often have a nice geometric shape to it. Um, if, if it's a, a dike, like I show in the picture there, often those cooling joints are, are 
the columns, excuse me, are, are horizontal. Whereas if you have a basalt flow and we, you know, devil's post pile, um, there, what's the place in, in Northern Ireland there, you know, there's spectacular, uh, Columbia river basalts. There's places where you have these spectacular columns and, and sometimes they're vertical. So they, they propagate perpendicular to the cooling surfaces. My field area, I did a master's uh, thesis on, on a, a ragged top caldera, which was in the Trinity range south of godforsaken Lovelock, Nevada. Um, <laughs> there was these, these really cool little dikes of rhyolite that cross-cut the, this caldera that I worked on. And you could go pick these up. And some of them were, were three feet across and, and you'd have a column that was, you know, three or four inches in, in diameter. And they, they can, they're, they're, they're cool structures actually. Anything Thanks. else before we move on? But I'm, I'm glad you said something because it's, it's often easier to ask the question at the moment and, and when it's a little more relevant. So if we look specifically at the North Shore, so a lot of work's been done here. They've been mapping since the late 1800s. Uh, Newton Winchell, you know, our, our state geologist, uh, did a lot of work up there, and then subsequently, quite a quite a number of people, and you know, looking for mineral resources, uh, just doing the general geology. Uh, it's been looked at for a long time. Uh, one of the guys that that one of my advisors at UMD, I went there as a as an undergrad, John Green. You, a lot of people have probably heard of him. Amazing naturalist, not just geologist, but he knows he knows botany, he knows you know ornithology. Incredible guy. Very, quite an inspiration to me as well. He, but he made it part of his life's work to to understand the volcanology and the volcanic rocks uh, of this area. So he's responsible for a lot of, of the mapping, a lot of the naming of, of specific areas and, and a lot of our understanding of, of how this was, was basically built. And when we talk about, you know, what we call the Keweenawan period, which is this period of, of about 1.1 you know, billion years ago, it includes intrusive rocks. So magmas, basically the Duluth Gabbro complex, we call that. Some of you have heard of this. It's, it's where you know, they're looking to, to start some copper nickel mines. It, it is the third largest copper nickel deposit on the planet. Um, it's rich in, in copper and nickel and, and platinum group elements. And these were basically the magmas that fed the lavas that are now what we call the North Shore Volcanic Group. And we break it up into in basically three sections, but there's a Northeast limb, there's a Southwest limb that extends to Duluth, you know, the upper end is, is Grand Portage. And in between the youngest volcanics, which actually span the boundary technically, um, the schroeder lutzen sequence is, are, are the youngest volcanics that we know. Of in that particular region, you might see these little uh, what we <laughs> these little symbols here. Those those it's a, a dash with a, a little tick mark on one side. That's an orientation marking that we measure in the field, and it, it it's what we call the strike and the dip. So if you have a planar feature, that planar feature we can actually put onto a map, and what it represents, the long axis of that symbol represents the intersection of whatever planar feature that you're looking at. And I'll, and I'll show you an example of this um, soon. It, it's, it's the intersection of a horizontal plane. You can think of it as, as a water level that, that encounters a horizontal feature. And it's the strike of that line that we can, we can put in, orient that in space. And we can say something about the orientation of that planar feature. The dip then is the dip direction of, of that feature. If you were gonna take and pour of uh, you know a glass of water down that planar thing, whatever you're measuring, the dip direction is is the direction that water would flow. So that that's useful in a lot of cases. It's use it's more useful often in sedimentary rocks. Um, it often says something about flow directions of of the fluids that were were moving the sediments. But it's important in in understanding, you know, the the physical volcanology. How do these lavas? Um, erupt, what direction were they flowing? Everything in this particular case though dips towards the axis of the rift, which is basically the center of Lake Superior. And we have we have the mirror image in, in a sense over on, on the Keweenawan Peninsula in, in, in Michigan. So it's kind of the opposite side of this, this basin. 
So it, it's way more complicated than what we see here, but John and others have, have simplified this to the best of their ability. And the oldest volcanic rocks are in, in Grand Portage and also then the opposite end at the Southwest limb, we have the oldest ones um, basically uh, Southwest of, of Duluth um, and the Nopamine quartzite. There's, there's an interesting outcrop there that actually the basalts that have, were erupted, the very oldest ones were, we know were erupted underwater. They have what's called a, a, a pillow, um, the pillow structure. It's it's a pillow basalts. I, I should have a picture of it, but I don't. Um, it, it's an indication that that uh, those lavas were actually erupted underwater. So that's kind of the, the overview of that. And so from here, what I thought we would do is talk about some specifics. You know, if I <laughs> Somebody, some of you, I, I suspect, actually uh, recognize this spot. It's it's a really really cool spot that John Green was was instrumental in actually preserving, and it's Sugarloaf Cove, um, and it's it's one of my favorite spots, and it's it, it, beautiful. They used to uh, it was it was useful in the lumbering industry where they were were felling trees, they were gathering them here. And then they would we they would bundle them up and take them across to uh, to Ashland to the lumber mills, until that got too expensive. But what John recognizes is in his mapping, um, there's absolutely spectacular volcanic features that are that are here. So I thought we would talk about if you, and this could be any beach, you know, um, what are we going to recognize? <laughs> what are the rocks we're going to throw in the lake? When we we go down there and start poking around, and then and then how does that relate in a sense to what are the rocks that we actually see in outcrop? So again, if 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 people do have questions, don't don't be afraid to to holler. I'm happy to happy to stop. So here's here's a typical beach. You know, the grain size is different. So sometimes it's boulders like here. Sometimes it's sand. Um, usually it's in between. In some case, the 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 rocks here are rounded. Uh, they've been beat up. Some of them have been carried by glaciers. Some of those have simply been pounded by the waves. But if if you have some understanding of what to look for, you can you can identify most of what's there. And if I look at that, I see a lot of colors. But I see, you know, I, I think I could, I should be able to name every rock that's the rock that's there. Not saying that you you can. My hope is that you'll look at these maybe a little bit differently in the future and, and, and ask yourself some questions. And you, you can usually get to the answer if with, with some simple inferences. So what I see there is, is mostly volcanic rocks. I, I should say mostly igneous rocks. I see volcanic textures and I see intrusive textures. Um, I see some metamorphic rocks. I don't see many sedimentary rocks. Um, for example, that white one there, I can see some texture in that. I can see some banding and I know that that's a metamorphic rock. So this wasn't derived from the mid-continent rift. This was derived from the rocks to the north. We know that it was delivered then by the glaciers. We don't know which one, we don't know when, um, but we know that rock came from the north somewhere. If we look at some other ones, these are all different types of igneous rocks and have some have different compositions, some have different different textures. Sedimentary rocks, which again, we'll talk about a little bit, you know, is that one? And turns out <laughs> another word we use for that is urbanite. So it's, it's concrete. So from some of the structures that existed when they were doing the, the logging there, um, sedimentary rocks don't tend to last in these high energy environments. So we don't see a lot of them. And again, the metamorphic rocks are, are derived from elsewhere, but, but you can recognize them relatively simply in, in, in most cases. So most of you know, we have three main rock groups. There's igneous, sedimentary, and metamorphic rocks. And the mid-continent rift is predominantly igneous rocks. Some have, some have a, a, an eruptive history. There's, you know, they were erupted as lavas and some are, are intrusive. There are sedimentary rocks that are products of, of erosion of those, those Different rocks, metamorphic rocks within the rift proper don't necessarily exist. I mean, to some degree they were, depending on where you are, but generally they're they're 
formed outside of the Midcontinent Rift. So we'll concentrate a bit on the igneous rocks. So these are just three random pictures of rocks that we use in our labs. Um, but if we're gonna identify these things, we look for specific things. We look for the texture, which tells us something about the cooling history. And we try to say something about the composition. That's where it gets a little more difficult, you know, to try to identify things, especially if they're small grains. Uh, that does take some experience. Um, there, there's a few tricks, but a lot of times the texture alone is enough to say, yeah, I, I, I'm pretty confident that this is, this is a volcanic rock. But these are the things that we're gonna see in the North Shore predominantly, because that's where they formed and that's what's eroding currently. So the cooling history, the different environments that here's a, you know, a, a cartoon of a, a cross section of a, a sedimentary sequence of rocks within the earth's crust that are being intruded by magmas. And if, if this magma down here labeled Pluton, if that was gonna stop and cool slowly, we would it would have a specific texture. We would be able to say something about the origin of that rock. If that magma made it up and was erupted as a lava, those lavas and maybe pyroclastic deposits, volcanic ash, will have a specific texture and we can say something about the, the, the cooling history and, and the origin of that. Um, where it gets a little more complicated in differentiating the two often is where you have these intrusions that occur as dikes and sills. These are the terms we use. Um, if it's a small volume, it can cool quickly and it can look for all practical purposes like, uh, like a volcanic rock. So it, it's, it's not always clear cut, but it's, the texture is what, what tells us you know, what we would name it. The composition, on the other hand, to really name a rock, we have to we have to identify two things, and the composition is a function of a of a number of different processes. You know, we have melting of the mantle of an olivine rich mantle that produces melts that are basaltic. We call those or mafic. They're rich in iron and magnesium. Um, if it cools slowly, we would call that you know we would call that a gabbro. If it was erupted onto the Earth's surface, like on the North Shore, like in Hawaii, like along the Mid-Atlantic Mid -Atlantic Ridge, we would call that basalt. They have essentially the same composition. And this chart here shows us what minerals we might expect uh, to, to find in rocks of those compositions. And it changes depending on where we are in this compositional spectrum. And mafic rocks, again, rich in iron and magnesium, low in silica. Um, as we go up the ladder, if you, if you will, of this, this compositional spectrum, granite and rhyolite are essentially the same thing. They just have different cooling histories, but those are rich in, in silica and sodium and potassium and, and lower in iron and magnesium and, and, and calcium. What's kind of cool is, you know, these eight minerals, if, if you can identify those, you can identify almost any igneous rock on the planet. So if you ever want to spend a little time on thinking about composition and, and you know, really being able to, to confidently identify some of these rocks is learn how to identify those eight minerals. The seven, basically, muscovite isn't, isn't real common. And the other ones, there's, there's tricks to figuring that out. But to truly identify and classify uh, an igneous rock, you have to say something about the texture and you have to say something about the composition and the composition we get from the mineralogy. And that is difficult at times when it's cooled quickly and the grains are really small. So continuing down this beach at Sugarloaf, which I did last Friday on a beautiful day, I started seeing repeating themes. And here's some of the common things that you're actually gonna see. So again, a mafic igneous rock, it might have a, a slow cooling history, it might have a rapid cooling history, but we know it's gonna be rich in, in minerals that contain iron and magnesium and, and lower in things, you know, we're, we're probably not gonna see quartz in that, in rocks such as, it may think against rocks in, in general. So these actually are all related to each other and they have different cooling histories. So a gabbro, if we go back again to that chart, you know, a gabbro has a, has a slow cooling history. Um, and it's the intrusive equivalent of a basalt. And these are all different varieties of basalt that have similar chemistries, but
but they have different textures. And if you can recognize these, you can say, hey, I know I've got a volcanic rock there. Or here I've got this dark igneous rock. I see a crystalline texture. Um, it's, it's probably mafic. It's, it's probably a gabbro. In a lot of cases, you'll be safe. So, well, how do I know these are basalts? Well, the matrix, you know, the bulk of these rocks have cooled really quickly and it's really difficult to see the crystals. And that's, that complicates it. It's, it's, it's hard to tell what minerals are present, but if it's dark, it's likely mafic. Amygdaloidal is this funny term that we use. If, if you see these white spots, those are actually secondary minerals that are filling in what were gas bubbles in a volcanic rock. So you had gases evolving. They didn't escape. The rock cooled quick enough, trapped those. And sometime later, fluids moved through and deposited different things. If I look at the next one, that's a vesicular basalt. So that's also, you know, similar composition, but in this particular case, those gas bubbles haven't filled in with secondary minerals. Those are probably the easiest ones to identify as a volcanic rock. This next one's one of my favorites, actually. I have, well, I, I don't know if you can see all the crap in my office, but I have a rock that I collected in my backyard in, in Esco, Minnesota. I'm gonna grab it. And I don't know if you can see it, although I can wait till we go full screen. But this is the same as this, this what we call porphyritic basalt. We have a matrix that is fine grained. We have these large pink crystals that are actually a mineral called flagiclase. Um, I collected that rock in my backyard. I hauled it all the way out to Washington State where I did my master's degree. I cut and polished and then brought it back. Um, and one of the reasons it's my favorite, if you see this, I. I haven't mentioned these yet, but I assume some of you maybe are, are avid fans or not, but Lake Superior agates form in, in volcanic rocks in the, in the North Shore. And if I'm in glacial deposits around the Twin Cities, uh, Moose Lake, you know, not so much around the lake, they just, it tends to get picked over and they've, they've been pushed south by the glaciers. If you see this rock, you know you're in, in stuff that will contain agates. That's my indicator rock. And it's, and it's quite pretty, actually. This next one is a little bit unusual, but it's, it's, it, it looks like snowflakes, basically, on the surface. They call it ophitic. It has to do with, with the way that the minerals in there crystallize. It's actually pyroxenes that are are enclosing plagioclase. These are, are some common minerals within in basalts, but it's a very, very uh, common texture that we see on the North Shore. Um, leopard rock, some people have called it based on those spots, but you'll see that pretty frequently. The next one, you know, th there's a textural term we use called affinitic. It just means we can't see the grains. And, but it's basalt and, and you see lots and lots of this up on the North shore and it polishes beautifully. You know, the, the, those are fun things to, to pick up and, and put in your garden. So that's, that's the mafic end of the spectrum. So these are the dark rocks. The reason they turn red like that is, is because of the iron. The iron that's present actually will oxidize. On the opposite end of the compositional spectrum, we have the felsic rocks. And we see lots of these in, in places up there. And if it's coarse grained, if it's plutonic, if the magma didn't make it to the earth's surface and cooled slowly, we can see those grains and we, we would call that a granite. There's a lot of this stuff around St. Cloud, you know, cold spring quarries are there. Um, those are much, much older rocks actually than these, but granites are, are relatively common in the rift. More common are the rhyolites. So Palisade Head is, is a famous one. Um, there's a Lakewood Rhyolite just north of Duluth. There's the Canons Creek, Kimball Creek. There's a whole bunch of these, these really large ones uh, way up on the North Shore. And they tend to be pink. You, you tend to be able to see quartz within there. You tend to see a mineral called potassium feldspar. Um, you can confuse them with, with basalts because of the iron and the oxidation that's there. That's why they turn red. Um, but these are really common. And we, again, we have this, this term porphyritic just simply means we have a, a, a bimodal assemblage 
of grain sizes. We've got larger grains that typically are large enough to, to actually figure out and, and identify. And the matrix tends to be smaller and that's much, much harder. We have different tricks that we use. We, we can actually make what's called a thin section. Um, I actually have one here, not that you can see it. I have a rock here that is sliced to 30 microns, 0 0.03 millimeters. And we look at that under the microscope and light will pass through that. And we can actually identify what minerals are present using a, a petrographic microscope. What I'm floored by is, is who thought, you know, grabbing a, a basalt and who, who was the first guy to think, well, maybe if I grind it thin enough and, and attach it to a piece of glass, I can actually figure out what's there. It's, it's an incredibly powerful technique, but not something you can do when you're, when you're standing on the beach. Another relatively common rhyolite that we see is, is something we call flow banded. And so you see, you see this texture that it, it looks like it's stretched and bent and folded. And that has to do with the fact that rhyolites tend to be sticky, more like taffy when they're erupted. If, if they're not erupted as, as pyroclastic flows, um, like a, an eruption, say like Mount St. Helens, um, they tend to be very sticky and, and slow moving and, and become contorted and, and look like that. But granites and rhyolites are the same composition. Basalts, gabbros are the same composition. They just have different cooling histories. And, it, uh, you know, this, this is stuff we, we spend weeks on in certain classes. So I'm, <laughs> I'm flying by, they're flying through this. Any, any questions? On these last few slides. Okay. Holler if you got any. So sedimentary rocks, you know, I'm just kind of moving through the different the different groups. Um, they're they're there, you know, we're weathering those volcanic products and they accumulate in certain cases if there's enough time and if there's enough weathering. Um, sedimentary rocks are really important for a lot of things. One, we can say. You know, looking at the texture, we could say something about the energy and what, what was the environment of deposition. Um, looking at sedimentary structures like ripple marks and dunes and mud cracks and things like that, we can say what the conditions were. Um, composition will tell us something about the tectonic setting, which is important. They're not a, as abundant in the rift. Um, they tend to weather away and they, they, they get flushed out to, to deeper water. We, we, we don't see them. They're really important in certain scenarios though, because, because they're, they're reservoirs for, for hydrocarbons and they're reservoirs for water. Um, and they hold the history of life. So when we talk about the history of life and, and fossils, that's, we, we tend to look in sedimentary rocks because that's where they're contained. This picture though, is, that's a panorama. I took, I think like six or seven shots. That's Good Harbor Bay. And it's, it's the Cut Face, Cut Face Creek um, sandstone, which is, is kind of cool. So I mentioned environments, you know, when we look at sedimentary rocks, we try to think, okay, where did these things actually form? Did it happen in a marine setting? Did it happen in a river? Did it happen in a lake? Is it, was it in the mountains? Um, you know, terrestrial versus marine is important and, and especially when we're, we're talking about Earth's history and, and recreating environments and, and where did things actually form. But I've up at Sugarloaf, I found this was in that, you know, that pile of stuff. And that's, that's a sedimentary rock we would call a conglomerate. What's interesting about this is you could see the bits and pieces. So these little rounded rock fragments, I think that's a big chunk of quartz, um, but these, I can see little gas bubbles in it. I know those were volcanic rock fragments. So this rock doesn't have an extraordinarily long history of transport. Um, and we know that this is derived locally, that those bits and pieces are the volcanic rocks that were weathering to produce you know, a, a, a sediment that then got lithified and, and turned into a rock that we call a conglomerate. And then I go back to this, you know, the Cut Face Creek sandstone. This is one of the thicker inter, we call these interflow sediments. So there was periods of, of, of no volcanoes, you know, so the eruptions weren't happening over long periods of time and you were weathering these surfaces and you were accumulating sediments along these, these, these surfaces. And this one happens to be a sandstone. There's, there's finer grain material in there, there's siltstone. And then, 
above that, you can actually see the next sequence of basalts that were erupted onto that surface. But this whole sedimentary unit is about 100 meters thick, actually, and there's volcanic rocks below that. I went and poked around in the ditch there, and I hadn't really seen this stuff. So these are mud cracks, which means the fine-grained sediment there was periodically desiccated, which means it had to be exposed to the surface. I didn't know those existed. That's actually kind of cool. Which means they, they weren't deposited in deep water. But uh, Leaf Erickson Park has a pretty significant section of, of interflow sediments. But once these break off, they, they tend to not last. You know, they're not real well, what we call cemented or indurated. Um, and that'll break up, especially in a, in a beach setting. Those won't be preserved very well. So you almost, you have to see them in place. Another thing that we, we see in places is what we call these clastic dikes. So these are sediments that we're collecting in these fractures on the surfaces of the basalts. And there's, there's a good example at Sugarloaf as well. But we see these all, all throughout the rift. But sediments, again, not as common. And then the metamorphic rocks, like I mentioned, are derived from elsewhere. So we know that ice had to move these, rivers had to move these, um, and push these, these boulders and cobbles and stones and sand-sized particles um, to where they exist now. These are all within Sugarloaf Bay as well. And you can usually identify them relatively easy. We see this layering. We can actually, I mean, you probably can't see it at that scale, but there's a fold that's in there. These are, are what we call gneisses. We know that these were, were pre-existing rocks that got buried and compressed. It probably was tectonically active. Um, and we started to segregate minerals into light and dark layers. That indicates a high level of metamorphism. And we call that a gneiss. If you've been to Jay Cook State Park and Thompson Dam, there's slates there. Those are, those are lower metamorphic grade rocks and they haven't been recrystallized. Um, to the extent that these are, but those are, that's another example of a metamorphic rock. And then this isn't the classic banded iron formation. Um, this is probably from the Gunflint formation, but it's, it's equivalent time-wise to, to what we see in the Vermilion and the Masabi uh, iron formations. And that's probably about, you know, 1.85 billion years, we think those, those rocks are. But another example of a, a this, in this case, it's a sedimentary rock that's been metamorphosed and changed from its original, original conditions. So those are the different rock types that you might see on the shore. Um, some of those will, well, I'll show you some outcrop pictures too. And some of the other features that you can look for when you're, when you're poking around up there, whether you're in a boat or whether you're walking on the shore or whether you're driving up, you know, Highway 61, um, these are some of the things that you can, you can look for. So we've been mentioning lava flows. Well, when you see planar features like these and you see fine grained igneous rocks, um, you might suspect that those are actually lava flows. This, if you've been to Hawaii, these, these are, are quite prevalent. There's, there's a lot of places on the planet that we see them. A lot of them are much, much younger than we, <laughs> than we have here, but they're, they're pretty, pretty diagnostic. And we can see they dip off towards the center of Lake Superior. And we, if we looked at those closely, we could see the textures. There's another one on Sugarloaf too that's, that's quite a bit thicker. So here's the base of this one flow. But this one is, you know, at, at least three or four meters and significantly different than these, which is, which kind of begs the question, why, why did that, that style of volcanism change? And it could be something as simple as, as the outlet of, you know, something got dammed and that, that, that lava couldn't flow out and accumulated or what we call ponded. It's, it's possibly that, it's possibly a slight change in composition. And it was, it was um, a little thicker and more viscous. Um, <clears throat> and it could have been just volumetrically. It, it could have been erupting lots and lots of it at, at one time. But it was just an interesting, as a, as a volcanologist, it's an interesting change from, from what we see on the rest of that, that particular uh, peninsula. If you go way out to that point at Sugarloaf, you can beautifully see the orientation. You know? So that's, that's the dip angle of those lava flows. So you could, you could, you could measure the, what we call the strike and dip of the orientation of those particular rocks. 
So some other things to look for that, that kind of cement the idea that these are lava flows are, are these what we call pipe vesicles. So we have these little vertical, um, these are technically amygdules. Those are secondary minerals that are filling in vesicles, but those form at the bottom of certain lava flows. And we see that pretty frequently at, um, at least at Sugarloaf and in some other places too. And they're beautiful markers to, to show the boundaries between successive lava flows. There's another one, you know, so there's at least two flows right here. And this is the third one that, that extends below that one. So it's a, it's a great spot to see that. Um, also in that spot, basically I turned around, here's the boundary between this lava flow with the pipe vesicles at the bottom and this ropey, what we call, you know, pohoihoi, that's the term they use in, in where it originated in Hawaii. It's, it's that fluid ropey surface that, that we see that's preserved in rocks that are a billion plus years old, which is, is actually kind of incredible. This is why, this is part of the reason why John Green, you know, took to this place and, and wants to preserve it. In fact, we got an email, most of the geology departments around the state um, in, in this region, he sent out when he got this designated as a, as a, um, I don't know if it's an SNA technically, but it's, it's an, it, it's a protected area and he doesn't want people bringing in rock hammers and collecting things here. And it, and it makes sense because these are, these are absolutely spectacular features that are, that are preserved in, in, in ancient rocks. But that's a great example of a, of a flow boundary. There's another little kind of a, a, that ropey surface that indicates, you know, high temperature lavas that are very fluid, that are, you know, flowing out over a surface and you're preserving, you know, those, those ripples, if you will, in that surface. Any questions on salts? <laughs> Igneous rocks in general. These are, it's just, I would highly recommend that that's a fantastic spot to go see some just classic volcanic features is, is Sugarloaf. Other places have it too, but uh, not to the extent, you know, they're, they're as well preserved here as I think is, is anywhere uh, along the North Shore. If you start poking around too, then you start seeing these, these vesicles that are filled in with secondary minerals and, and zeolites are a common secondary mineral. A way to think about this is, you know, we've got these gas bubbles, these vesicles that are that are preserved that then you have fluids moving through. If you've been to Yellowstone, you know, what's the highlight of Yellowstone is the geysers and the, the, the pools that are, are these heated, you know, hydrothermal waters. Well, those contain lots of different elements. And, and if, if that fluids move through a system, if those fluids move through a system, you can deposit secondary minerals. And the sweet that you get, the types of minerals you get kind of depend on, on what, what's being weathered, what the original magma types and lava types are, and, and at what depth is this actually happening? So you get different suites of, of secondary minerals depending on where you are in, in what we call the volcanic pile. I actually, <laughs> I wouldn't say it was a no-no. I took a tiny, tiny fragment of this particular mineral and I brought it back and I just, I ran it today on my X-ray diffractometer. I thought this was Thompsonite and turns out it's actually a, a, a zeolite mineral called scolocyte. And they occur together and they're relatively common. Um, but that was kind of a surprise to me. It was kind of cool. So lots of different, you know, most of you have heard of Thompsonite, Thompsonite Beach. That's, that's a, another type of zeolite mineral. Zeolites are an important group of minerals too. They actually synthesize them. They have these big, broad, open structures, you know, from an atomic standpoint. Um, they use them to um, separate hydrocarbons. So in the refining process, zeolite minerals are, are an important uh, tool in, in actually separating out and refining um, oil. So if we move away from Sugarloaf, I just, it was, it was a fantastic spot. But if you go just north of Brighton Beach, um, there's also a sequence of lava flows. This, and this is maybe more typical of a lot of the North Shore. Um, you have, you know, the, the boulders that are developed there 
are, are not as high energy, they get washed away. Uh, it does get actually quite energetic here. But what we're seeing, it's not as easy to see the flow boundaries between successive lava flows. And this embayment actually is the boundary of a lava flow. And the red sediment there is glacial till that's related to, to glacial Lake Duluth. Um, but the reason I pointed this out, even though it's not all that exciting, it is exciting because you're standing on the shore of Lake Superior. But if, if I turn around in this spot, and if you look down the shore, often you have this jagged pattern. And what that indicates is where the prominences are, where these points are, those are the interiors of the lava flows that aren't as prone to weathering. So you literally can kind of do your stratigraphy and you can look down the shore and see how many lava flows are, are within sight. And in this particular spot, there was three prominent points. Those are three lava flows. It's, it's, it's an interesting way to, to think about it. And it's an interesting way to do, do the mapping. And again, if you go back to you know, where this boundary was, where all those secondary minerals are, where all those vesicles were, those amygdules, that's much more susceptible to weathering than the massive interiors that, that cooled more slowly. Simple, simple observation, but it's, it's, it's kind of profound. And it's, it, once you start recognizing these things, uh, you will. It's like, hey, I, I see some things here that, that, that most people probably don't. And then I think I showed this picture earlier. So this is in a similar location. We've got basalt flows that are cut by this, this basaltic dike. Often these will have a fine grain margin where they cooled against the, the country rock. These dikes or what we call feeder dikes were probably pushing magma up to a much, much higher um, lava flow that's now gone. It's, it's eroded away. So we see these in, in quite a few places. We also see fractures that fill in with secondary minerals. So here's the surface of a lava flow with this fracture. It could be faulted, meaning that you know we have some movement along that plane, but it looks like just a fracture. And then we get a whole bunch of different minerals that, that get deposited in there. Sometimes it's quartz, sometimes it's different zeolite minerals, sometimes it's calcite. Calcite is really abundant. They usually carry a, a little bottle of dilute hydrochloric acid and you, it's, a, it's a simple test uh, to test for calcite. There's other amygdala minerals too that are quite common. And if they're dark green, and we see this in a lot of places, I can see that this is a fine grained igneous rock. It was probably a lava. If it's dark, it's probably a basalt. Those green minerals, they're kind of apple green, um, is actually epidote. So it's a secondary mineral that fills in and it's quite common on the North shore as well. So th there won't be a quiz after this, but <laughs> The fact that this is recorded, you can actually go back and review this stuff. And, and if you're really interested, then I'll, I'll be happy to send you some classification diagrams and, and, and a couple of simple little tools that, that you know, guidance documents that I, I would be happy to send you if you're, if you're interested in pursuing this. But it, it's, it isn't that many minerals. Um, it, it, if you recognize a couple different textures and if you recognize a handful of minerals, you can identify almost any igneous rock you're going to encounter. And then one of the last secondary minerals I'll talk about, of course, you know, Lake Superior agates. Lake Superior agates form in vesicles. These are these are secondary minerals that are. It's agate is actually is quartz, but it's a variety of quartz we call chalcedony. And chalcedony is, is, is microcrystalline or cryptocrystalline, and it forms these little fibers. Um, these, these are big business. If you guys have been to, if you've been to Moose Lake for agate days, you know, people spend a lot of time um, looking for these. And the big ones are worth quite a bit of money, actually. Nobody's ever synthesized one. If you could synthesize an agate, you'd be wealthy because you know, it's a finite resource is we use them for various things, not just for sitting on a shelf and, and looking pretty. Um, they're, they're actually quite useful for certain applications. I've, I've been looking, there's, there's a pit I would look at down here in the Twin Cities, been going to for like probably 25 years. And my students talked me into to taking them out. And this was, I remember the date, it was April 28th, uh, 20, 2013. We got arrested. And I ended up having to go to court. 
and it was it was kind of a fiasco. It's kind of taken the wind out of my sails uh, for sneaking into places and, and looking for agates, but that 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 might be okay. Anyway, I like agates. A lot of people like agates, but they're a common, you know, they they form in vesicles within volcanic rocks within the rift. They're they're probably the oldest volcanic hosted agates um, on the planet, actually. Another cool spot. Beaver Bay, if you've ever been down to uh, uh, the bay there, there's there's secondary minerals there. This was a zeolite that I, I looked at. I It didn't look quite right. I mean, I thought I knew what it was. I brought some back and analyzed it, and it's something called stellarite. And it's a, it's another form of, of a different zeolite called stillbite. I like minerals too, but I have, I have cool toys. That's, I'll throw that out there too. If you guys have, have stuff that you don't know what you have, if I've got the time, you know, I, I'm happy to, to to zap these things or you could come in and visit my lab and I'll, I'll show you some some cool toys, the scanning electron microscope or the X-ray diffractometer or the micro XRF. Um, I, could, I could show you. Moving on, I, we're, we got to, this is probably going on too long. Um, here's another just north of Duluth. This is a, a chunk of a pre-existing lava flow that was been incorporated into the overlying lava flow. As that moved across the surface, it picked up pieces of the underlying flow. We call those, we call those xenoliths. Um, we can see those in places. There's another one next to my hat. And uh, that's, that's relatively common. This was interesting. So another intrusive feature, you guys probably know where Silver Cliff is and the tunnel that was built there. And the backside of that is, so this is an intrusive contact. This is a large sill. It's too big to be called a dike um, that was intruded into the basalts there. And it's kind of deformed them as well. And it, it's, it's a big, big feature that we see there. Interestingly, and I don't know if you can see this, but there's a couple right there that's, they were, they were having a wedding. Literally, this was Friday afternoon and they were having the ceremony right up by the, by the cliff. And I, I walked by him and, and congratulated them and took some pictures and left. But that was kind of interesting. But this is this is a really cool spot. And this is a good example of, of one of these larger intrusive features. And it's part of what we call the Beaver Bay Complex. Are we are we okay on time? I got just a few more. Sue, are we all right? Uh, yeah, maybe uh... We're starting to get a collection of questions here too in the chat that I okay. I'll I'm going to whip through. You. I'm just I'll whip through these last few slides and it's just some a couple of my favorite spots. Okay. And I'll hurry. So Black Beach, which is is mine tailings basically, or outside of Silver Bay. There's these granitic um, prominences and islands that uh, I, I love this spot, and we we bring students here all the time. Uh, this is a cool example of one of these dikes that cross cuts the granite and it shows the differential weathering that happens between mafic and felsic rocks, whereas the mafic ones are more susceptible to weathering. That's a cool feature. Um, the, the beach that is developed behind one of these prominences is, is one of my favorite beaches. You get these large chunks of, of granite that, that weather out there. And an interesting project we had a number of years ago, we didn't know the age of these rocks. And we didn't know these granites look very similar to the Archean rocks that, that occur to the north um, that are about two and a half billion, 2.6 or seven in certain cases. We didn't know if it was that age or whether it was related to the, to the mid-continent rift, was it 1.1 billion? So we collected some, we had a student, uh, Natalie Judah was her name. We extracted a mineral called zircon and from zircon, we can actually take that and, and, and get an age date from that because we can measure the ratio of uranium to lead. And it's it, using these radioactive isotopes, um, we can get an age date. And we found out that these rocks were actually Kiwanau in an age, which means they're, they're 1.1 billion. So that was, we didn't know that. That was an interesting, interesting result for, for a kind of a cool little project. But fabulous beach, love that spot. Um, Carlton Peak, some of you guys have probably been there. That was, if you know the story, this is, this is the rock that started the company 3M. And so the five founders thought they'd discovered this enormous deposit of, of corundum. And corundum is a mineral that's, that's really hard. 
it's next to diamond in, in hardness and they could use it for abrasives. Well, <laughs> turns out it's not. It's, it's the mineral called, it's plagioclase feldspar. And the rock is, we call that an anorthosite. Um, and it, but it was enough to get the company started, but it was, it was a pretty significant mistake. I don't know where most of it went, but they, it's, it's a really cool spot to, to camp. They, they actually have a, a, a pit toilet that they've installed up there. Um, there's no campsites proper, but we've camped on that ledge. The, my favorite, one of my favorite nights camping was, was here and you overlook Lake Superior and the lake was so calm that night. This was back in probably 98 or 99. And you could actually see the reflection of Jupiter and Saturn in the lake. It was, it was that calm. It was just, yeah, it's a, it's a cool spot, really cool spot. And, it, and it's a cool rock. It's what makes most of the highlands of, of the moon is, is, is a rock called an orthocyte. It's coarse grain. You can see that it cooled slowly. You know, it's an igneous rock based on the texture. But that, that's one of my favorite spots. And then last but not least, I'll just mention, you know, Palisade Head. Most people have been there. Uh, what's interesting about that is it, it's a rhyolite. And turns out with some careful work, John Green, again, and his student, Tom Fitz, who teaches now at Northam College in Ashland, discovered that this was actually a, what we call a pyroclastic flow that was so voluminous and so hot that it welded back together and looks essentially now like, like a, a lava flow, even though it was a pyroclastic posit. If you think of Mount St. Helens, which blew in 1980, that was a cubic kilometer of material. So 57 people died, you know, hundreds of, of square miles were, were leveled, if not thousands. One cubic kilometer, this particular eruption, a minimum estimate is, is 600 cubic kilometers. So the volume of eruptions like this in Yellowstone and some of them in Colorado, you know, they dwarf Mount St. Helens, which is, is kind of interesting. But it was careful observation. It was looking at thin sections. Um, it was careful mapping. They actually figured out the origin of, of that particular rock, which is not, not just a simple lava flow, which is kind of cool. All right, that's, that's a lot of material. Um, Again, you know, you, you can find me on, on the web too if you want to email me questions in the future. But if you've got questions now, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to answer them to the best of my ability. But thank you. Thank you, Jeff. I'll, I'll cover some of the questions that people put into the chat and then we can open, okay. up, um, open up if others have more questions. So the first one, does the mid-continental rift correspond at all to the continental divide that is in that general area? Well, there's the, I'd have to look at the watersheds. Um, yeah, the Laurentians up there, what's the other one that, you know, the rift in, in essence, yes, but, but also no, meaning, so Lake Superior drains to, to the Atlantic, whereas further down the rift, you, the watershed is, is the Mississippi River. Um, it's Lake Superior proper, Lake Michigan. I mean, those are low spots and it's due to subsidence based on this accumulation of all this really dense material. Um, it, the answer is kind of yes and no. All right, next question. This is a rift, like what is happening now in the Atlantic Ocean that was spreading 1.1 billion years ago? What made it stop spreading? That's a great question. Um, Cause if it had continued, it, it would, that'd be the, uh, the shore of the ocean, you know, we'd, that'd be the coastline. And we don't know, for example, or for specifically what caused it, but we think a mantle plume was involved similar to, to what's in, in Iceland that's producing all the, the volcanic rocks there. Uh, it's possible that that volcanic plume just stopped for whatever reason. It also could be tectonic. And there's something called the Grenville orogeny, which is a mountain building event, which is east of, of the rift proper. And it's possible that that, that compression, um, that tectonic activity was enough to, to maybe shut off the mantle plume or just keep it from, from expanding. That, great question, but we don't, we don't have a great answer for that. Next question, does calcite mean it contains calcium? It, it, well, it doesn't mean it contains calcium, but it's, it's calcium carbonate is the mineral 
And calcite reacts to, you know, I, I have yet to test vinegar. They say it will bubble with vinegar. I don't know if that's quite strong enough. Um, but calcite also has, has a, as a cleavage, meaning it breaks in planar, uh, a planar fashion. Um, it's really, once you know what to look for, it's really easy to recognize even without using, using an acid test. And there's lots of calcite on the North shore. Um, another person was wondering if you could post a link to the documents you mentioned. Um, yeah, I was going to, I should have had a reference. Um, I'm happy to do that. And I'll, I'll, I have a few references here that uh, if you want to get started, the place to go though is, is the Minnesota Geological Survey. They've just, there's so much information that that's there, maps and documents and things like that. But I, I'll ask you, Sue, how, I don't, how would I share that information? Well, that is a little tricky because we have some members, but we have a members members only email. I could put it on Facebook, but um, the, it was the Minnesota Geological Society. Geolo Geological Survey. Um, one of the slides, that one map, I'm going back to it. Yeah, I should have had a reference slide, but you guys, you, you can also email me, um, thole at mcallister.edu. You can find it on our website too. Uh, I, I can send you some information, but right here is the MGS website, which is their repository of, of information. And you can search things like, you know, the, the Schroeder um, geologic sheet, uh, the, there, there's a, a report of investigation. What's it called here? Report of investigation number 58, uh, which is the document that this, this particular um, map came out of. But anything geologically related to, to Minnesota, you can find through the, the MGS website. Okay. But I've, oh. I've, I do have other references I could, I could share as well. I guess I can probably stop sharing my screen if you if you emailed them to sue or me jeff we could um we could post them to members and put it on facebook and we could also uh attach it to the recording when we put it on youtube uh, yeah. oh sure yeah absolutely well i'll i'll get a list to to you guys for that absolutely okay great and here's here's a, a burning question <laughs> Where did you get arrested? Uh, it was an aggregate industries pit here in the cities. In fact, uh, I'll be specific. It's the one uh, just, it's where 94 and 95 cross each other right by the St. Croix River. So it's, it's one of the biggest pits I've ever been in. Um, and again, I'd never had an issue, but uh, what turns out, the reason it happened is it was a perfect storm of bad timing. Because we had gone in there on a Sunday, usually is normally fine. Um, but somebody had been into the pit that night and they were cutting cable and stealing copper. Uh -huh. So the cops had been there and the pit boss was was kind of angry about that. And the, the, we were there and, and happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time and actually had to sit in the back of a cop car and ended up going to court. And yeah, it was it turned out to be kind of a kind of a pain in the butt. Hmm. Does anyone else have any questions? I got through all the questions in the chat. Yeah, this is Rob. I do. Uh, is Shovel Point also the rhyolite like um, Palisade Head, or is that different, Rock? It's it's an extension of the same lava flow, well, okay. or or pyroclastic flow, and it even goes beyond that. But yes, that's that. It's it's the same rock type, same Good. same eruptive unit. I also have a question. Um, Thompsonite. Now, I, my understanding is that in northern Minnesota there, that's the only place that Thompsonite is. Is that true? I don't believe that's true. I, okay. I think I think Thompsonite is a relatively common. Um, I, I, I don't know for sure. The, that green, comp, you know, the green type. Well, green Thompsonite tends to be pink and white. 
you know, it, it almost looks like agate in certain cases. Um, okay, so what was it you called the green stuff? Maybe the, that's the what the green is is a mineral called epidote. Epidote. Okay. And I'll epidote have to look is, more into that more. <laughs> yeah, and th there's some great, you know, you know, rocks of of I don't know what they're there's some references out there that, that talk about, you know, the different rocks that you find in the Midcontinent Rift. And some are related to the Keweenawan Peninsula in Michigan, and some are related to the North Shore. Um, I know I didn't mention the uh, the Beaver Bay Rock, the agate shop there. That's one of my favorite rock shops. And Keith, the owner, donated a, a really cool geode that we have as part of our, we made a, a fluorescent mineral display. Um, he has some great agates and then probably my favorite fossil on the planet I've seen is there. And it's, it's a dragonfly that's draped in calcite. And I don't know where he got that or where it formed, but it's, it's spectacular. Wow. Thank you. Any yeah, other I have a question. What is Thompsonite? So I've seen it up at Thompsonite beach polished but i i don't know what that is yeah it's 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 a, again it's one of these secondary minerals it's it's uh what we call a zeolite and a zeolite is a group of minerals that form in relatively low temperature you know they're not it's not magmatic it happens in hydrothermal systems it happens in in places like yellowstone um it happens you know in the mid mid ocean ridges that are you know there's a lot of you know, hot fluids moving around and depositing secondary minerals. Okay. Um, but it's, yeah, it's a secondary mineral that's common in, in volcanic terrains. I just, I, I think it's in, in other places too, but I think it may be Thompson. Thompson, I was, was it named from Thompson Beach or was, I, I, I think it, they took the name from the mineral just because it's abundant there, but I think it's found in other places if I'm okay. not mistaken. Thank you. It's pretty. It is beautiful. It's very pretty, yeah. I have a question. I used to spend a good amount of time on the North Shore and heard of the Laurentian Shield. And supposedly the Laurentian Shield had some of the oldest exposed rock. And somebody else then argued with me, oh, no, the rock on Nova Scotia or somewhere else is older. Well, <laughs> Laurentia is an ancient terrain but the the canadian shield is is you know basically all of the the craton and and these archean rocks um that are very very old um i guess i haven't heard it called the laurentian shield but laurentia um i don't know the the etymology of of the that particular name but but laurentia is, is an ancient terrain um Laurentian Divide is a is a place that divides watersheds, um, but it it's it is ancient rocks and yeah. one, ones that are quite old. What's interesting, what's kind of cool, I show my students this, and, and to me this is pretty humbling, and I probably can't see it very well. This is a metamorphic rock that's from the Acasta River in Northwest Territories. This rock in my hand is four billion years old, so oh, I can wow. hold. A rock that is has been around for the majority of, of Earth's history. There's no, we have older crystals we found, older zircon crystals, but we don't have any older outcrop rocks. This is the oldest rock in outcrop that that exists. And where is that is, from? It's Northwest Territories, and, and it's along the Acasta River. They, it's called the Acasta River Nice. Okay. And it's it's four billion years old, which is is pretty humbling. Thank you. What, way older than me that's very cool <laughs> can you show that rock from your backyard now that you're on full screen oh yeah yeah wow so this and wow. this so normally pink means potassium feldspar well there's enough iron in this rock that it's actually stained these plagioclase feldspars uh pink and, you know, you would look at this and you think, oh, it's got to be a rhyolite. Well, it's actually a basalt because it's dark. But here's another good example. See the green spots? That's, yeah. that's epidote. So that's, that's a common secondary mineral, too, that we see in, in, in mafic igneous rocks. But, yeah, I, hold, I found this in my backyard, wow. dragged it out to grad school, 
spent a week cutting cutting and polishing rocks when I should have been working on my thesis and then and then <laughs> hauled them back. Wow. I have rocks that have gone many, many miles. In fact, I was just in in uh, Las Cruces, New Mexico. We I brought my parents down there to visit their friends and there's a place called the uh, um, Kilborn Hole, which has, I have, I brought about 80 pounds. I brought about 80 pounds of, of the mantle back. So this is peridot. You know, it's, it's chunks of the mantle. That's the rock is called a peridotite and it's, that's mostly olivine. So this is the rock that generates most of the mag magmas, the melts that, that contribute to, you know, igneous rocks uh, across the planet. But it's a it's a cool place to go to go collect stuff. And my daughter, I I purchased a, uh, a faceting machine, and she cuts gems now. Um, and she's she wants she actually wants to get peridots big enough that she can she can make her own um, wedding rings, mm. which is kind of cool. Anything else from Jeff? Well, uh, Jeff, this is Rob again. I really appreciate that you did all that studying and work so that I don't have to. <laughs> but I also understand that it's a great excuse to travel the world, you know. There's rocks Absolutely. pretty much everywhere. <laughs> and if and if it's not rocks, it's it's something else geologically related, and there's going to be rocks underneath them. Indeed. <laughs> I do appreciate it though. Very good show. My pleasure. Yeah, thank you.